If you're gonna be alone in abandoned places or in the dark, you might as well get paid for it, right? Well, sometimes even money isn't enough to endure the creatures, phantoms, and creeps that wait in the hollow corridors and dark hallways of a security guard's workplace. So let's see if you can survive the night with these allegedly true security guard horror stories. The first few are new, and some are a blast from the past. So enjoy, and be sure to share your scary experiences with me at darkstories.org. I'd love to hear stories from national forests, being lost in the woods, and werewolf sightings. Now, let's begin. A Dire Confession From C-Note 78 I work as a transit security officer in Vancouver, British Columbia. My job entails dealing with problems on the bus, if someone is drunk and causing a problem, or if someone is passed out and not waking up. We also rode the buses to check to make sure people pay their fares and are not cheating the system. Anyway, on this particular night, which was a graveyard shift as we work from 7.30 p.m. to 5.30 a.m., I had ridden in one of our late night buses from downtown to the suburbs of Surrey, which was about a 90 minute bus ride. We got through the night without any hitches. My partner and I were in the patrol car, heading back to the office to finish off our paperwork for the night, then clock out. My partner was driving, and I was the passenger. It was about 4.45 a.m. then, and it was in the fall, so it was still dark out. That's when I see this guy standing on the side of the road, just staring at the cars passing by. As our car is about to pass by, I make eye contact with him. I still remember those beady little eyes of his. His eyes looked left and right and back and forth when all of a sudden, he runs out into traffic. Luckily, my partner sees him and swerves to avoid running him over. I tell him to pull over the car. Then we run over to where the guy was standing as he's walking back to the curb. I'm upset at this guy, obviously, as we almost hit him with the car. I began to yell at him, asking him what the heck his problem is. I wanted to know if he knew how close he was to getting killed. It was at this point I got a good look of his eyes, and I can see that the guy's not all there. I changed my approach and asked him what was going on. Maybe we could help him if he tells us what's happening. I'm thinking this guy is on some heavy drugs, or has a mental illness of some kind, or both. The man then looks at me and my partner, and says, I need to talk to a justice of the peace. I need to confess. My partner and I look at each other, both with confirming looks that this guy is crazy, and maybe we should call the cops. I ask him, what's going on, buddy? What do you want to confess? The guy refuses to talk to anyone except for a justice of the peace or judge, and again says he needs to confess. My partner starts to call it in to dispatch, as I try to get some more details and a name, a date of birth, address, etc. As I'm trying to get more information from him, another wave of cars begins to approach, they would be passing by momentarily. The guy just keeps repeating, I need to confess. I need to confess. Then he takes another shot at running in front of the passing cars. The fight was on, and lucky for us, the guy wasn't very large in stature. Maybe 5'5 five five and 140 to 150 pounds. I was well over his size, and I had a partner for backup, who was fit and an active athlete. So the guy was easily subdued, and since we felt he was at risk of harming himself or someone else, we decided to handcuff and arrest him for safety until the police arrived. Try as I might, I wanted to get him to tell me what he wanted to confess, but he kept wanting to talk only to the justice of the peace. The police showed up shortly afterward and took the male into custody. 
This happened in 2016, and it still bothers me to this day. What did he want to confess? Maybe there was a house with a dead body somewhere, or maybe he was just out of his mind. We'll never know, I guess. The Shadow Man from Jack Mustard in the spring of 2011, when I began working as a security guard at a major tech company, one of the other officers made a remark to me before he left the building. Don't let any odd sounds get to you, he said. I told him most sites have unusual noises and they don't really bother me. I'm unlikely to encounter anything of a supernatural nature here, I said. Oh, I don't know about that. He replied. Being constructed in 2001 with its data center and telecoms, the tech company's site had the look and feel of something off a Star Wars set. It was a new high-tech structure with no history and no known tragedy. Besides me, the only energy there was computer energy. For nearly the first three years of my job, my initial assessment was proven correct. But... There was one night in 2012, when I was reading a blog, I caught a glimpse out of the corner of my eye of a pitch black figure flashing across the second floor. Near the security desk is a large circular opening where one can see the walkway on the second floor. It looked like a robber dressed in black with a face mask, except it moved fast. It moved faster than any human could move. I brushed it off as nothing to be concerned about and continued to read my blog. I never mentioned it to anyone and I forgot about it. I didn't see it head on so it didn't really exist to me. It was a figment of my late night imagination. Fast forward about one year on the 3am patrol. I had an encounter far more real and chilling than the previous one. During the hourly patrols, the four telecom rooms and the data center have to be checked to ensure the computers do not overheat. To reach one of the telecom rooms, one has to traverse a dark corridor, which opens into a dimly lit office area. As I came out of the corridor, in my peripheral vision to my right, I saw a black, translucent figure. The figure stood approximately six feet tall. One could discern a head, neck, torso, and limbs, and it appeared to have short dreadlocks. I turned to look at it and actually saw it straight on for about two seconds. It was black, faceless, but definitely real. I jumped backward and let out what seemed to be a loud yell. No one could hear me. The shadowy figure stepped back and blended itself into the background. The atmosphere lightened and returned to normal. Needless to say, the main lights went on and stayed on early that morning. When the security supervisor relieved me that morning, I asked him if any tragedies had occurred in the building or near the site. I considered him a reliable source to ask, as he had worked at the tech company since its opening. He said that no one had died on sight, and he didn't remember anyone with short dreadlocks ever working there. Could something have happened prior to the construction of the building? Further research into the history of the place turned up nothing. To this day, I'm still uncertain as to who or what the mysterious shadow man or shadow men were. The Night of the Creeps from 19 Delta Scout. College is a time of great paradox. You spend a good portion of your day in class, and if you want to pass your classes, you need to spend a good portion of your night studying. Oh, and if you do need money, you'll also need to find a job. And heaven forbid that girl who took you home from the party now thinks you two are a couple. It was a constant juggling act trying to balance school, study, work, girls, and sleep, because devoting too much time for one took away from the others. My parents weren't rich, so I didn't want to ask them for money, and I wasn't ready yet to join the military and let Uncle Sam pay for my college tuition, so I had to get a job. I thought I'd found the perfect job, 
one which paid me fairly decently while allowing me to study and do homework at the same time. Yep, I became a security guard. It wasn't a bad gig. The site I was assigned to was an office building, which was located across the street to an FBI branch office in a low-crime area of the city. I got there at four in the evening and escorted office workers to their cars until the building closed at five. After five, I would do a few security patrols around the building, letting the cleaning crew into the building at eight in the evening and letting them out at midnight when my shift ended. In between that time, I was free to study and do homework from my desk inside the security office. I was basically on my own, and for six months at the site, I only saw my security supervisor four times. Like I said, it was a sweet gig. Then one Friday before my shift was to start, I got a call from the security supervisor asking me if I wouldn't mind working the graveyard shift for a few weeks out at a site located in what was known as the Great Dismal Swamp. The hours were from 11 at night to 6 in the morning, and because the site was so remote, the job would pay an additional $3 an hour. I quickly agreed. I could use that extra cash. Since I got off at 6 in the morning and my first class started at 9, I had plenty of time to get ready for school. I met my security supervisor at the main office at 11 that night, and once again I was not impressed by him, which is why I was happy that I rarely saw him. He was middle-aged with a beer gut, absolutely no muscle mass on him whatsoever. His hair was, in my opinion, too long and scraggly to inspire confidence in someone who was supposed to be a security guard, and he had a bushy, naughty movie stash, if you know what I'm saying. His hairy arms had really tacky-looking tattoos, which he said he got while he was in the Navy, but they looked like tattoos that you'd get while serving time in prison. In fact, if it wasn't for the security badge and uniform that he wore, which was disheveled and unironed, his picture looked like it should have adorned the walls of the post office. When I met him, he was visibly drunk, and he smelled of alcohol. He told me to follow him, and he got into his old brown and primer gray Dodge Al Bundy-looking mobile that had magnetic signs on the rust-colored doors that read, A1 Security Services. I got into my brand new Chevy Camaro, which I paid for during my senior year in high school, from money I saved working part-time jobs since I was 15. I then followed him as he screeched out of the parking lot and onto the highway. It was a Friday night, and this being a huge military town, it was military payday. So the highway was packed, but traffic was moving quickly as we took the exit towards the city of Chesapeake, which was built on the Great Dismal Swamp. We were on the road for a good 45 minutes, going deeper and deeper into farm country, passing several rivers and streams. The traffic had all but vanished long ago, and the streetlights were few and far between. Still, we hadn't reached the site. I was seriously thinking that this guy was bringing me out here to kill me, dump my body into the swamp. A suspicion that got stronger when he turned off the main two-lane road and onto a gravel road, which wound between the viney trees and weeping willows. The narrow road ended at a dilapidated parking lot, at the end of which stood what appeared to be an abandoned two-story building. Behind the run-down-looking building was a canal, which connected to the Elizabeth River. One tilted light pole holding two light bulbs, which flickered on and off, illuminated the parking lot, and aside from the old building with vines crawling up its sides, there was nothing else in the area except dark, foreboding trees, swamp and probably the ghosts of past security guards, which this guy took out here to kill. To my surprise, however, the creepy old abandoned building was well lit from the inside. Come on, kid, said my security supervisor. Let's get you inside. It's not good to stay outside here for long. Huh? I said. <clears throat> Nothing, he answered. As we continued walking, I saw several other run-down structures next to the building, though these were not illuminated and hung in the shadows. As we got closer to the building, I saw it had been vandalized, with several windows broken out and spray-painted graffiti on the walls. 
there was also a slightly foul smell in the air, like wet, rotting vegetation mixed with sweaty gym socks that were left inside your gym bag in the trunk of your car for a week. This used to be an old paper mill a few years back, said my security manager as he opened the door into the brightly lit main lobby. The door hadn't been locked. The mill went out of business and just sat here until it was bought by a Dutch company that wants to start it back up sometime next year. Till then, they want us to keep watch over the facility to discourage vandals and such. We walked down the main corridor, which was littered with broken glass, leaves, and more graffiti, past a broken set of double doors and towards a room at the end of the hallway. Doesn't look like there's been any vandals here for a while. I observed as our footsteps echoed across the tomb-like building. Probably not, my supervisor replied. We got to the room at the end of the corridor, which ended up looking like an old boiler room, with rusty pipes and gauges and whatnot. A large table stretched across the wall where windows looked out across the canal outside. Three old black padded chairs were at the table. Well, here we are said my supervisor. Be careful when you do your roving patrols as there may be some raccoons or other animals which have made this building their home. And watch out when you walk around outside for snakes and whatnot. Did you bring a flashlight? Uh, no, I replied. I wasn't told that I needed one. Mm, okay, he said. Well, let me get out of here. If you run into trouble, just call 911, then call the night shift supervisor. Keep the lights on, and I'll see you in the morning. Uh, wait, I said. This seems like a pretty nice site. Peaceful, nobody to bug you, and you get paid extra? What's the catch? My supervisor looked annoyed. No catch, he said, leaving. Just can't get anyone to stay on the site. Roy, the new guy, quit this morning after his shift here ended. Really? I asked. But before I could say anything else, my supervisor added, Oh, one more thing. Ned's running late, but he'll be here with you later. Remember, keep the lights on. He walked out before I could say anything else, and I can't say I was sorry to see him go. I looked around the boiler room and saw that there was a coffee pot and an old, dirty microwave at the end of the table that I guessed the previous security guards had been using. There was also an old, touch-tone phone that I assume I could call the police with if Jason Voorhees decided to rise out of the swamp and hack me to death. I figured I'd wait for a little bit and get settled in before going back out to my Camaro to get my schoolwork. If I finished my assignment tonight, I'd be free for the rest of the weekend to use my Camaro for what it was intended for, to be a chick magnet. I sat on one of the rusty old black padded chairs and nearly fell over backwards as the back support was broken and gave out. The creaking noise seemed to echo down the hallway. I rolled it aside and tested another chair, finding that that one was fairly stable. I sat down and scanned the table some more. I found the security duty log from the night before that was on a clipboard. The report from the new guy, Roy, was still on it, which meant that he never returned to the main office to turn it in. Apparently, he just hauled tail out of there this morning. Roy's printing was neat and tidy, all in block letters and easy to read. I wondered why he would just leave the log here when he knew he should have turned it in. That's how a guard gets paid. With nothing else to do, I read the log entries. Midnight arrived on site. Security supervisor instructs me to ensure that the lights remain on in the building. Advised to call 911 if there's trouble. 0030 hours. Conduct security patrol around inside a building. Several lights flickering on and off in upstairs corridors. Zero one hundred. Lights in parking lot flickered on and off. Thought I saw movement outside. Went to investigate but found nothing. Zero two hundred fifteen. Lights in the security room have gone out. Lights in main hallway downstairs flickering on and off. 
going to look for breaker box. 0230. Cannot find breaker box, but I thought I saw someone outside looking through a window in the security room. Going to investigate. 0250. There's definitely someone outside. Called to the person, but when I got around to where he was standing, he was gone. The last entry was sometime after that. I'm not sure what time it was exactly because Roy didn't write it down. However, Roy's handwriting was no longer neat and uniform, but shaky, almost as if he panicked. It simply said, All lights completely out. That's not a person looking into the window. I'm out of here. I tossed the clipboard back onto the table. So what, I thought. Did a badger scare you away? The lights in the room flickered for a second, but came back on. I thought I saw something at the window out of the corner of my eye, but I dismissed it as a trick of the flickering lights. I leaned back in my chair, wondering when the other guard was supposed to be here. I usually worked by myself. I didn't know too many other guards. I'd heard the name Ned before, but usually as old bloody Ned. I wondered if that was the same guy. I decided it was a good time to do a patrol around the building, to get a feel for the place. I used the term patrol loosely, as it sounded more professional than having fun exploring a creepy old abandoned paper mill. As it turned out, as far as abandoned office buildings go, it was pretty unremarkable. Downstairs had a cafeteria and break room with long aluminum tables and empty snack and soda machines. There was a front office and a conference room with empty desks and filing cabinets filled with old invoices, shipping and receiving documents, and pay stubs. By the way, if you used to work for an old paper mill in Chesapeake that went out of business, you might want to know that they still have old pay documents that have your bank account info still on them inside old filing cabinets. Anyway, the upstairs had two halls lined with offices and a storeroom which had cleaning supplies and a set of metal stairs, which led to the roof and the air conditioners. Dust and cobwebs covered the corners and walls, as well as shattered glass that hadn't been disturbed for ages. And aside from the lights flickering on and off occasionally, there really wasn't anything particularly spooky about the place. I then decided to go back out to my car to grab my school backpack and the dinner that I'd packed two double-decker smoked ham and bologna sandwiches, with Swiss cheese and the right amount of spicy mustard and mayonnaise with a tall can of Pringles chips and a couple of ice-cold Red Bulls. This was going to be yummy, as I'd only eaten lunch about 12 hours earlier. I was famished. I returned to the boiler room, tossed my backpack to the side, and laid out my dinner, anxious to sink my teeth into those delicious sandwiches. I first wrote a quick entry into the security log, 0130. Completed security patrol around building. Lights flickering occasionally, but otherwise all secure. Just as I turned to grab a sandwich, all the lights in the building went out. I sat there in pitch blackness for about two seconds, annoyed that I'd have to look for the breaker box when the lights flickered and came on dimly. The lights were flickering when I heard a shuffling noise coming from the main hallway. Slowly, I got up, easing the seat back quietly in order to hear better. Yeah, there definitely was something shambling down the hallway towards me. By then, the lights had come on completely again as I approached the door to the boiler room and opened it. I was quickly confronted by a terrifying apparition, he was tall and skinny with a pot belly, pale, white, and old with long wisps of white hair dangling down from his wrinkled, liver-spotted bald head. His nose and ears were large and broken teeth lined his open mouth. The apparition stared at me through crazy-looking eyes. You must be Ned, I said, reading the name on his dirty uniform. His uniform looked worse than my supervisor's and Ned smelled of cigarettes and alcohol. That's me, boy, said Ned, pushing past me and walking towards the table. Old bloody Ned, they call me. Sorry I'm late. My son had to go pick me up after the bar closed so that I could get here. 
Ned slumped down on the seat I had been sitting in. He'd obviously worked this site before. Yeah, they sent me here to keep you company, boy. It appears all you young folks are too afraid to be out here in the swamps by yourselves. Ah, oh, sandwiches. Ned picked up one of my delicious double-decker smoked ham and bologna sandwiches with Swiss cheese and just the right amount of spicy mustard and mayonnaise and began chomping down on it. Hey, that's my din- You know why this place chases off so many people, said Ned, ignoring me. Because of you, I said, slumping down on the broken chair. Don't mess with me, boy, retorted Ned, chunks of bread flying out of his mouth as he spoke. I swear kids today have no class. No, boy. Take a look out the window. Across the canal. You see all them trees out there? Uh, nope. I see the reflection of some old guy eating my dinner in the window and a whole lot of black night. Dang it, boy. Well, if you could see out there, back behind them trees is an Indian graveyard. Back before the white man came, this land used to belong to the Chesapeake Indians. That's me, boy. I'm part Chesapeake Indian. Okay. Assuming that you're telling me the truth, the canal is pretty wide, and the trees are far across the bank. That would put the graveyard pretty far from here. They moved the markers, but they left the bodies here, boy. Here, right where they built this paper mill. They say it went bankrupt because they angered the spirits of my ancestors. I rolled my eyes at this drunken old creep. Like in that movie? Hmm, what movie? He said, now opening my can of Pringles. That movie where they moved the headstones but left the bodies, and that little girl got sucked into the TV, and then a stuffed clown tried to drag that little boy under the bed. Ned looked at me questioningly. Are you on drugs, boy? Exasperated, I grabbed my other sandwich and my Red Bulls, then rolled the chair to the far end of the table where I'd thrown my backpack. At least I could get some schoolwork done. I took out one of my extremely overpriced textbooks and turned my back on Ned. I tried to get in the zone to do some homework. You afraid of blood, boy? Said Ned. Because I can't stand boys who are afraid of blood. I always say you don't deserve to call yourself a man if you're afraid of blood. Heck, you may not deserve to live if you're afraid of blood. I slowly turned, now determined to keep an eye on this insane old man. Uh, no, I don't really spend too much time obsessing about blood, Ned. That's the problem with you young kids these days. All weak and pathetic. I was in Vietnam, boy. We rolled around in blood and guts every day. Blood, boy. Buckets and buckets of blood. My father did two tours of duty in Vietnam. He was with the Marines, and he never talked about rolling around in buckets of blood. Bah, Ned exclaimed, waving his hands dismissively. Blood isn't death, blood is life. I hunt, you know. Mostly deer, and every time I hunt, I take the blood of my kills and I put it in a metal tub. Then I get all naked and climb into the tub. I absorb the life of my kills in that tub, and I take the spirit of the deer by drinking its blood. Well, I'm not hungry ever again, I said, pushing my sandwich towards Bloody Ned. When my kid got old enough, I taught him how to hunt too. When he got his first deer kill, we drained the blood into a bucket, and I made my son pour the blood over his head. Blood, baby. Blood. <laughs> With all Ned's talk of blood and guts, I could feel myself getting nauseous. You look kinda white there, boy. You ain't afraid of a little blood, are you? No, I said, getting up on wobbly feet. I'm going on a patrol. Get some fresh air. Don't let them ghosts get you, boy. <laughs> Cackled Ned as I left the room. Sweating with spots appearing in my eyesight, I staggered down the hallway and stepped outside, feeling instantly better. 
where in the world did they dig up that vampire? I walked to the parking lot under the flickering light pole and took deep breaths until the horrific images that Ned implanted in my head faded away. It was deathly still with the calming sounds of water rippling down the canal, mingled with the songs of frogs and crickets. Suddenly, the street light went out and all sound seemed to cease. Even the lights coming from the building seemed to flicker and dim. Without a flashlight, there was no point in being outside any longer. Reluctantly, I began walking back to the building, back to where Ned was at. I decided that if he was still crazy when I got there, I would move to the cafeteria area and spend the rest of the shift there. As I walked toward the building, across the dark parking lot, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched. That made me not like Ned all the more with his stories of Indian ghosts and burial grounds. The lights were still flickering as I walked down the main corridor to the boiler room. The flickering lights would make it hard to do homework, but fortunately, they usually didn't flicker for very long. And by the time I made it to the boiler room, the lights were back on. Ned was still in his seat, facing outside toward the window. I'm back, Ned. I said, but he didn't move. Uh, Ned? I stood in front of him looking down. Ned was slumped down in the chair, eyes closed and completely still. Uh, Ned, I said again, looking to see if his chest was rising and falling, and it wasn't. Uh, Ned! I leaned forward, attempting to put my hand on his chest to feel for a heartbeat. Blood. Ned cackled as he smacked his lips, dreaming, getting comfortable in his drunken stupor. Blood. <laughs> he said again as he began snoring. God dang it, Ned. Then the lights went out completely. I stood in darkness for a second, noticing that the temperature had dropped. The hair on the back of my neck raised as I slowly turned around, feeling that eerie feeling again that I was being watched. Outside the window, hands pressed against the glass. There was what appeared to be a very, very white little boy staring at me. Though he was ghostly white, he appeared to be Latino or Native American. Short hair looking like it was cut in a bowl cut fashion framed two abnormally large eyes, colored pitch black, and his mouth was wide open as if in a silent scream. As I stood there, too shocked and terrified to move, the most ridiculous thought came into my mind. You aren't nearly as creepy as old bloody Ned behind me. Though I couldn't see his eyes, I knew that the little boy was staring right through me. Slowly, he began to fade away, as if being called back or being swallowed by the darkness until he disappeared. Soon, even his little handprints in the window were gone. When the boy faded away, the lights immediately came on. Strangely, even though I was terrified, I didn't sense anything malicious coming from the apparition. I took my backpack to the abandoned cafeteria in order to do my schoolwork thinking that if the little boy had a problem with us, he could come back and get old Bloody Ned first. In fact, I thought, please get old Bloody Ned. I was working on my assignment for so long that I didn't realize it was almost time for shift change. To my surprise, my security supervisor came into the building at around 15 minutes before then. Old Bloody Ned was asleep the whole time until shift change, when he finally woke up. My security supervisor shambled down the corridor, smelling of alcohol. His eyes were bloodshot and he was obviously hungover. Old Bloody Ned awoke and stumbled over to him. Hey, son. Old Bloody Ned said. Son? Hey, Pa, my supervisor said. I brought the car for you, Dad. Ugh, I thought, that figures. Old Bloody Ned is my insane supervisor's dad. How'd your shift go? My supervisor asked. Ned pointed at me. This little boy spent the night shaking in his pants, son. 
Heck, I couldn't keep him awake through his shift. He's a freaking coward. My supervisor looked at me with disdain. Boy, you're a pathetic sack of lazy crap, ain't you? Not really, I said. Old bloody Ned got into the old rusty Dodge and drove away, saying, I'll be back to pick you up at one o'clock. As Ned drove away, I turned to my supervisor. Hey, man, I have a suggestion. My supervisor rolled his eyes. What do you want, you cowardly little college boy? I let his remarks light off me as I said, Look, this is a pretty easy sight. During the graveyard shift, there doesn't need to be two people here. When I come back tonight, Ned shouldn't be here. The Rat, submitted by Soli Americas. Around 1980, I had just gotten out of active duty service with the US Air Force, and I decided to stay at my father's house in Massachusetts until I could find a place of my own. It wasn't easy trying to find a job, but soon I landed a security guard position with a big security company. This company had a contract to provide service for a big electronics manufacturer about 20 miles from my father's place. I had left the military with an honorable discharge and an old beat up Chevy Nova and little else to my name, so I really needed the job. I drove my old car to the electronics company where they gave me a baggy uniform and a big flashlight. My shift was to be from 11 p.m. to seven in the morning. I was given a tour of the buildings by the administration supervisor, which took nearly two hours. Let me tell you a bit about these buildings I was supposed to wander through all night. The place was a turn of the century, massive three-story brick mill that was originally built to manufacture textiles. It also had a huge basement and another smaller warehouse-like building across the street. The main building easily took up a city block and was one of the biggest structures in the small city. The interior had been renovated to accommodate offices, laboratories, manufacturing space, and other work areas. It was pretty much a maze in there and the place stunk of chemicals for electroplating electronic components. It wasn't my idea of the best job in the world, but it was a start. I felt that if I put up with it in the meantime, that I might be able to move up in the company itself. That way I'd be all set. The building across the street was used by the electronics manufacturer to store things like packaging materials, old furniture, and other assorted junk. There were two ways to get into that building, either go outside and cross the busy street or go through an old tunnel underground that ran under the street. It was part of the guard's rounds to inspect the big building and the building across the road several times every night. I've always been a night person anyway and have always sought jobs where I could work alone. I hate having a boss hovering over my shoulder every minute and I hate coworkers complaining and gossiping all around me. So checking through the dimly lit buildings was no problem for me and it wasn't really scary for me. The worst was just having to call the cops a couple of times because kids either tried to sneak into the ground floor breaking bottles outside the front door or they would do graffiti on the outside walls. Nothing really major or extraordinary. Not yet, anyway. What always bothered me though was that dang building across the street. It was a ragged looking building. It looked to be even older than the main building it had filled stone walls with big steel double doors in front and no windows. One of the steel doors had a smaller door in the middle and that's where we usually went to do our checks. When you opened the door, you had to go down about eight stone steps to get to the warehouse floor. The filled stone walls were crumbling and in some places, you could actually see through the cracks between the stones. I'd been told that sometimes drunks or homeless people had managed to get in there either by breaking the small door or because someone had forgotten to lock it. I was warned to keep an eye out for these people and if I saw any, to just get away from them, then call the cops if I found them in there. Part of my responsibility 
was not only to protect things, but to keep myself safe as well. Now, usually I preferred to cross the street to get to the other building, but one night it was snowing heavily and the wind was wailing like crazy, so I decided to use the tunnel underground. The tunnel was about five feet wide and easily seven feet high. It was made of cobblestones that were always wet and the place was colder than a freaking refrigerator. The tunnel was just a straight line across the street, but underneath, and there were small dead end passages off to the left that only went about 10 feet before they stopped. I have no idea if that was all that was left of some other tunnel that connected to it, or if that dead end had some other purpose. Anyway, I started through the tunnel, which had no lights, so I was carrying my big flashlight and it was blazing a path through the tunnel. I was on my way to check the warehouse. I got about halfway down the 40 foot tunnel when a noise made me stop and listen. It was the sound of a scrabbling noise that stopped me in my tracks. I'd always suspected there might be rats down in the mill's basement and the tunnel, but I hadn't seen any in the two months I'd been working here. I slowly began to move my flashlight back and forth to each side of the tunnel, keeping an eye out for anything that might be moving. It didn't take long to see eyes being reflected back at me, eyes that were a mix of green and yellow in the light, and behind them was a large and dark silhouette, and then I saw it move, and I knew right away what it was. It, it was a rat a rat bigger than any rat I've ever seen, even in the movies. This thing was as big as a large dog, no joke. It looked like it weighed 400 pounds easy and had very dark gray skin with some white under its chin and its eyes were huge too. In proportion, they were far bigger than they should have been. I kept my light on it as it began to step into the middle of the tunnel still staring directly at me. Now, I'm five foot eight and I was raised near a swamp. I've seen my fair share of rats, but this was a completely different beast, and I mean that literally. In seconds time, I decided that my security guard paycheck did not cover confrontations with monsters, so I took a step back from this abomination, never taking my eyes off of the thing or my light. If that thing wanted the tunnel to itself, it could have it. Then the way a curious smaller rat would, this creature suddenly stood up on its hind legs, bringing its height to about my chest area and showed me a mouthful of seriously needle sharp teeth. Then it made this disturbingly ear grating high pitched hissing sound. I had no doubt it was a you shall not pass threat and I took it very much to my pounding heart. I wasn't going to come any closer. Slowly, I was backing up, never letting the creature out of my sight until my back touched the tunnel door into the main building. And in one quick motion, I was out of there. Luckily, that evil thing just stood there the whole time, watching me retreat. The only mention I made of this confrontation was to the afternoon guard I relieved when I came on the next night. I was curious and a bit disturbed, so I just asked him if he had ever seen any rats in the tunnel. He said he didn't like going through the tunnel, so he never used it. Then he made a joke about being afraid of rats and I just shrugged it off. So I decided I would avoid using that tunnel as well. I didn't want to risk running into that thing again only a few days later, this same guard was doing his last round, around 11 p.m. He went across the street to check the warehouse. He discovered that the small door that we used for entry was broken open, but being the brave fellow he was, he decided to go in anyway to check it out. He told me that he went down the stairs and took a few steps across the floor. He saw what he thought looked like a man lying on his side on the floor with his face turned away from him. The guard, of course, assumed that it was just another drunk or homeless man because the man appeared to be dressed in dirty old clothes. Then he heard a strange crunching, sticky noise as he called it, 
and he took a step forward to the man on the floor to see what he was doing to make that noise. As the guard approached, he said a massive rat, bigger than a dog, stood up from behind the man's body. It stood on its hind legs and jumped over the man, charging the guard right away, knocking the flashlight out of his hand and biting him straight through his glove. The guard screamed and said he threw the beast off of him and stumbled up the stairs and out the door slamming it shut behind him. He ran back across the street to call the cops and an ambulance. I arrived just as the ambulance was leaving, so I never saw the man my coworker had found on the floor, but I was told he was all right. He had just passed out drunk on the floor. The rat had found him and began chewing on his hands and fingers. It apparently started on his face and neck as well. He had permanent scarring from the event. I'm just glad that I wasn't the one who had to see it. The man was pretty messed up after that event and my coworker quit the next day and of course went to get anti-rabies and vaccine shots. I can't say I blame him. That would be enough to chase me away as well. In fact, I didn't stay there very long afterwards and I moved to another state for a better job. A few years later, my brother, who had worked with explosives while in the army, told me that he got a job at the same mill, the mill where I met the monstrous rat. The electronics manufacturer was no longer there and the new owners wanted the first floor removed to make a high space for some other kind of business. My brother set explosives and dropped the first floor into the basement in what I was told was a pretty spectacular show. A few minutes after the floor went down, my brother told me he heard what sounded like gunshots, so he went to the corner of the building to look down the alleyway to see what was going on. There were two cops down there, my brother said, who were part of a detail to keep people away during the demolition. Their guns were drawn and smoking. They were aiming towards an open bulkhead door into the basement. My brother asked them what the heck just happened, and one of the cops shrieked at him, saying some freaking nightmare of a giant rat had started coming out of that door and they shot at it. My brother went to look, but he couldn't find any such rat. But he said he was glad that he didn't see one because he really hates rats. Night Shift Security Guard, submitted by Aaron. I worked as a security guard for a few years after moving to a small city in British Columbia. It was a well-paying job and night shifts were more my thing since I was kind of an insomniac. I had just turned 20 and was now six foot three and 230 pounds. Just to give you some detail about myself, I was a bit of an intimidating guy, but everyone knew I was a sweetheart and I never caused any drama with people. I prefer to be alone myself. My coworkers often called me Jay because I always wore a Toronto Blue Jays hat. Anyway, I worked at a rather well-known nightclub and worked only weeknights. The place was pretty nice and had a DJ and everything. Well, one Saturday, summer had just kicked in and the nights started to get warmer and warmer. My usual partner couldn't make it in that night due to personal problems in which he had to go visit a sick family member. The club wanted to call in someone else, but me, knowing how annoying it can be for work to suddenly call you in, refused the offer. I told them I didn't need the help, so it was just me letting people in that night. As the line got shorter and shorter, I was informed over the walkie-talkie on my belt that I would have to stay late since I had no partner to help me let people out. It was slightly irritating, because the club runs fairly late anyway, usually closing around 3 a.m. It was only midnight then, and I realized that I would have to stand out there for three more hours, but I tried to think my best about it. So I responded over the walkie-talkie, joking, saying I better get paid double for this. After everyone was safe inside the club, I linked the red rope closed and leaned against the side of the building's wall. I decided to get on my phone and take advantage of the club's Wi-Fi. After about half an hour, I became bored of that and decided to have a cigarette. 
but before I could pull my lighter out of my pocket, a skinny man began walking up to the club from across the street. Slowly, I lit my cigarette and just watched him as he approached. I have pretty poor eyesight, almost legally blind, so usually I would either wear my glasses or contacts, but tonight I had been in a rush and I didn't have time to grab anything, so I couldn't really see the details of this man. All I could make out from this distance is that he was very skinny and dirty looking. The closer he got, the better I could describe him. He was almost sickly thin. He was wearing an old gray sweatshirt and ripped up blue jeans. He was shaven, but it was poorly done and uneven. His skin looked too pale and his eyes were sunken in. I tried not to judge though and continued smoking until he walked up to the rope I stood behind. Could I get your name, sir? I asked, since even though this is a club in a shady downtown area, we still had a list of people who paid an entry fee before showing up. We didn't take money on the spot, since we've had some incidences in the past with people bribing guards. He furrowed his brows at me as if in thought, then looked quickly at the list that was clipped to the other side of my belt. He then spoke. Uh, Thomas? Uh, uh, James Thomas? He asked in a questioning manner, which made him suspicious. Was he asking me or telling me his name? Not only that, but his voice was weird, like some sort of cartoon character. I ignored his tone and checked the list. Lucky for him, there was indeed a James Thomas on it. I quickly scratched out his name and picked up the rope to let him through. Well, have a nice night, I said to him as he walked through the big metal doors into the club. He then replied just before entering the doors, saying, oh, I will. A couple of minutes later, no one else showed up and it was now around 1.45. I would still have to stand there for another hour. However, a couple of minutes later, it was now 2 a.m. and there was a sudden shout from my walkie-talkie, which made me jump. It was a buddy of mine who worked as security inside the club. I didn't hear any words, just a loud yell, so I picked it up. Ryan, what's up, man? I asked calmly into the walkie-talkie. Jay, get in here! He was yelling over the bass of the music. I could barely even hear him over it. What's going on, man? I opened the doors and ran inside. One of the bartenders said she saw a weird homeless man with a knife. I quickly made my way into the main area where the bass of the music almost made me dizzy. The flashing lights and fog didn't make it any easier. Squinting, I slowly made my way to the bar, pushing past dancers and drunken men. When I reached my destination, the bartender, Eliza, explained everything to me. Jay, he's skinny and pale, and I saw him walking towards the lounge. Eliza quickly gave me a vague description and began repeating herself over the music. Almost hyperventilating, I tried calming her down, but she kept panicking and said that we should shut down the club and evacuate. I dismissed her idea, since the idea could trigger the man to do something irrational, and making this crowd of people panic could lead to some serious injuries or lawsuits. After finally calming her down, I began walking towards the lounge. I met up with Ryan on the way there. He was searching the lounge from a safe distance. Over here, it was a little less loud, which meant you didn't need to shout over the music. Do you see the guy? I asked Ryan, but he shook his head. All these guys are skinny and pale, he said to me. And even in this kind of situation, I let out a small laugh. I then looked into the lounge myself and noticed someone right away in the back corner. Even with my poor eyesight, I could tell that that was the same man that I just let in a few moments ago. It was the supposed James Thomas fellow. Knowing that I already had a suspicion of the guy, I tapped Ryan on the shoulder and motioned with my eyes towards the back of the room. He looked at the man and then back to me with a look that said, Are you sure? And I only nodded before walking towards James. As I approached, I noticed that he didn't have any empty glasses in front of him. There was nothing in front of him at all. This began triggering alarms in my head since people only come to the lounge to drink in peace, meaning he came back here for some other purpose. Once I was right beside him, I spoke up, 
saying that I need him to step outside for a moment. Oddly enough, the man nodded then got up and began walking towards the nearest exit. It was going far smoother than I expected. No complaints or anything. He didn't even lift his head up to acknowledge me. As we passed Ryan, who was on the cell phone with the police, I told him that I can handle it and asked if he could wait at the front doors for the cops. He agreed. Then I stepped outside with the strange guy. We were now in the alleyway that was located behind the building. The only light was a small light bulb that hung above the metal door. As soon as the exit door closed, the man reached for something and I asked if he would keep his hands behind his back until the police arrived. But he kept reaching and as I advanced towards him, he suddenly pulled out a knife. It wasn't huge, but it could do some damage if he knew how to use it. In a quick motion, one that I barely saw coming, he took a swipe at me with it, cutting open my chest, but luckily I had jumped back, so it was nothing more than a scrape. Now I was mad. So I grabbed his arm and disarmed him, and I pushed him to the ground. When he hit the ground, he began laughing, laughing while desperately reaching for his knife, which was now laying about three feet away. He just kept laughing, high-pitched and loud, and then he began to curse me, saying that he'll gut me like a fish and slit everyone's throats. This guy wasn't on drugs, he was just insane, and he really did want to hurt someone, just for the simple sake of hurting people. Soon, the sirens and police cars made their way down the alleyway. I let out a sigh of relief as I recognized the officer who was another friend of mine, so we could tell right away that I wasn't the dangerous one here. Michael, the officer, approached me and quickly cuffed the guy as I kept him down. He picked the guy up once I got off of him, but the man was still laughing. As Michael stuffed him in the back of the cruiser, the man yelled out, stupid guard, you're the one who let me in. It was all on you. Which he was right, I did let him in. I didn't bother patting him down, I just let him stroll on in. I immediately cursed myself for being so careless. Michael and I made our way back to the front of the club. He took the car while I quickly walked to the entrance. As I rounded the corner, I watched as an ambulance passed by with its sirens on. As Michael once again exited the police car, I asked in a panic if anyone had gotten hurt. He nodded and told me that a man just three blocks down the road had been knifed 30 times. I gasped. I asked for the man's name in curiosity, and Michael told me. James Thomas, I think. Why do you ask? I froze there, and Michael obviously noticed this. I slowly turned to face his vehicle and noticed that the man inside, who I thought was James, began laughing and shouting at me. He was taunting and threatening me. I told Michael everything, and he quickly notified everyone and made his way back to his cruiser and back to the station. Another officer told me that I might need to be a witness in a court trial, but luckily for me, I never had to attend. The incident caused me to take a few months off my job. I didn't quit, since I did love that job. I wasn't going to let one bad experience ruin everything for me. The club doubled its security and made it mandatory for outside guards to use a hand metal detector. The whole thing did shake me up pretty bad and it's kind of been burned into my head. I let a deranged man inside a populated club with hundreds of easy targets. Luckily, no, the only man that was attacked miraculously covered fully, but still, that crazy man could have injured a lot more people in the club and I'm just glad Elisa was able to spot him because if she didn't, this club would have never been the same and it would have been all my fault. Security Officer, submitted by Jaden. I'm a security officer and I had just gotten contracted to conduct Firewatch at an elementary school that was in a not so safe neighborhood. A really bad thunderstorm had come through the previous night, striking the building, which caused the fire alarm system to go down. 
to enter the school courtyard, the area surrounded by gates with keypads. The new supervisor needed to conduct a walkthrough with me at the beginning of the shift. I didn't really know the layout of the building, so coming up on a corner, I wanted to check it for any doors. My supervisor stopped me from checking, saying she needed to walk me through the rest of the courtyard and the perimeters, so I gave up and didn't argue, as me and the supervisor in question usually never see eye to eye on anything. An hour later, when conducting my patrol, I found a side access gate that could only be opened from the inside if you didn't have a key. The thing was, the access gate had been left open and was just hanging there. Without thinking anything of it, I just closed it myself, then went about my patrol as usual, not finding anyone at the time. However, a few hours later, around midnight, I had to go to the bathroom, thanks to some Red Bull and coffee, so I entered the courtyard to go use the one single person restroom that was left for us to use. After doing my thing, I slowly opened the bathroom door, only to see some skinny man who looked tweaked out of his mind, holding a knife. The man was twitching and shaking all over, his eyes darting in every direction all at once. He looked like he was about to explode. He was wandering the courtyard inside the gate I don't know what he was looking for, but he was definitely looking for something or someone. Then he began to scratch his chest with the knife. The moment I saw this scene, I shut the bathroom door and locked myself in, immediately calling the cops. But the man had seen me, and before I knew it, he was banging on the door, yelling in a delirious voice that he needed me to open the door or he would do the worst kind of things to me slow and painful things. Then I jumped back because he began to rake the blade of the knife under the door. That was the longest 20 minutes of my life. The cops finally showed up, but the man had left moments ago. Still, I waited for the cops to arrive, not ready to take any chances. The police conducted a search of the area, and unfortunately at the time, they weren't able to find the suspect. I didn't have much to give the cops to go on, as I only saw the creep briefly before locking myself back in the restroom for safety. Lucky for me, the thunderstorms from the previous night didn't take out the school's security cameras. However, due to the budget cuts, the cameras weren't manned 24 seven. Still, the odds stacked against us. The man was caught the following day after the school district pulled the security tapes. The tapes showed that he had entered from the same side gate, the same gate that I'd found hanging wide open hours earlier. Long story short, I refused to cover any more shifts at the school, only for as long as we had fire watch duty. I'm still a security officer, but I'm going to do anything I can to be better protected, just in case there's a next time.